Well, uh, uh, thank you. I think we're ready to uh, uh, to get started. That was a great uh, a great meal that uh, Chef uh, Victor and the gang produced. <laughs> Uh, and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I've got some old uh, clients, uh, but I was in private practice uh, a long time ago. Uh, and to say nothing of the uh, Cliff Dweller uh, regulars. And Charlie, I see you back at the bar. Uh, thanks for being here rather than watching Snow White streaming now on Disney Plus. <laughs> Uh, I was curious, as uh, maybe many of you were, in fact, let's see the number of hands of uh, people that remember the Nike uh, missile sites. So that's uh, over half. Well, good, because if you told younger people that we had uh, uh, nuclear weapons stored in our parks and harbors today, they wouldn't, they wouldn't buy it. Uh, but I remember poking around the Belmont Harbor site uh, a little bit. And uh, in the early 60s, uh, at college, I was a political science major, uh, and I took a course in international relations that focused on uh, the competition, the nuclear competition between the U.S. and the USSR in the first uh, decade of the Cold War. It was very, very interesting. Uh, I remember assigned reading included uh, uh, Henry Kissinger, then a Harvard professor. He was one of the few academics writing about that uh, kind of thing then. And uh, as the uh, Vietnam War grew apace in that uh, period, I came back to Chicago, went to law school, and then, uh, which is why we have this subject uh, before us tonight, I had the most extraordinary and unexpected postgraduate education in anti-ballistic missile defense. And it was all thanks uh, to the Army. Oh. I've kept uh, an eye cocked on this uh, area of uh, uh, of life in, in the news uh, in the decades since, but I was sort of taken back to this subject last fall when I noticed that, uh, and this was just striking, uh, it may have struck you the same way, the President uh, and the Congress actually agreed on something. <laughs> and uh, after being uh, thunderstruck, uh, I read into it, and of course what they agreed on was the creation of the Space Force and the attendant uh, uh, Space Command. Uh, uh, because uh, you know, the Army had given me this strange uh, education, uh, uh, last fall was the half-century anniversary of my working on the Nike successor, the Safeguard Anti-Ballistic Missile System, and it had taken me out to Kwajalein Atoll in the Western Pacific. It was then the western uh, terminus of the Pacific Missile Test Range, uh, and uh, uh, I got into that uh, uh, quite uh, deeply at the time, uh, looking into counter-espionage and counter-sabotage uh, issues uh, that affected the uh, missile system that was then under development. It hadn't been uh, deployed. I'll talk about the Nikes in Chicago. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, the safeguard system. I'll throw in a little bit of Cold War uh, history. And I'll talk about uh, uh, what has been going on that uh, leads us at this particular point in our history uh, to uh, have our military focus on space as a potential uh, war theater uh, that we need to to deal with. Uh, and then finally, I'll close uh, with a couple of uh, uh, comments about the doomsday clock and how, how it's uh, ticking. So when, when I was uh, uh, looking into this uh, last fall, I, I found there had been so much going on I knew nothing about. Uh, I came back to our, our past president, Eve Moran, and uh, uh, head of our programming, John uh, Pantsios, and said, uh, I think this might be interesting. Well, what do you think? Uh, they said, yes. Uh, so that's why we're here. And uh, should this little talk uh, bore the peewattle out of you, join me in blaming uh, <laughs> those two for get, getting us into this mess. <laughs> I hope... Uh, uh, you find uh, this whole subject as uh, interesting and fascinating as I have uh, over the years, albeit, uh, of course, uh, a worrisome matter to be talking about, to be thinking about. In the 1950s, you see here, uh, this was the national deployment of the Nike missile defenses. Uh, there were 40 defense areas and there were 200 Nike batteries uh, spread among these uh, defense areas. And the defense areas were chosen because of the perceived, their perceived value uh, to the Soviets in a Soviet nuclear bomber attack. 
The targets included Chicago and other large cities, uh, Air Force ICBM bases, uh, uh, you know, dams uh, and uh, the like. Chicago was the largest uh, of all of those sites uh, in the U.S. Now see, those of you that remember uh, Nike, see if you can find your, your location on that map. Uh, on the top right is the uh, site in Jackson Park, and below that is the Belmont Harbor uh, launch site. Uh, the Belmont Harbor radars were located just to the north at Montrose Harbor, and uh, uh, former President Bill Getzoff uh, uh, told me the other day uh, that uh, when he was in the Illinois National Guard, he actually patrolled uh, those, those radars. So thank you for your service, uh, Bill. And I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure at that particular time, uh, knowing how good he would be uh, on guard duty, I'm sure not one Viet Cong got across the perimeter fence. Uh. So the first Nike, the first Nike missiles were armed with enough conventional explosives uh, to uh, take out a single Soviet bomber. And then in 1958, uh, more is always better, uh, nuclear warheads uh, were put on the Nikes uh, so that they could take out multiple bombers uh, simultaneously. Uh, this is a short uh, film clip uh, that uh, is an Air Force film done for the Air Force, and it's about the Thor missile uh, that uh, uh, had uh, been developed uh, hurriedly in the 1950s and sent to Europe because our own ICBM force uh, uh, was not uh, ready at the time. Uh, so this is the Air Force film and it gives you a, uh, a sense of the threat environment as it was perceived then. Let us recall the birth of Thor and, as a matter of fact, the reasons leading to its conception. Like most war babies, Thor was conceived by international tensions. When the Russian bear came out of hibernation with a hydrogen growl, we needed a big stick and we needed it fast. We had already begun development of 5,000 mile intercontinental ballistic missiles, but while the ICBM program was proceeding favorably, Operational availability was still years away. We did have the immediate deterrent force of the Strategic Air Command, but how long could our bombers alone hold the Russian bear in check? Uh, so uh, this uh, history of the 1990s was prepared by the National Park Service, uh, which inherited some of the uh, Nike sites and also the Army Corps of Engineers, which uh, had designed them. Uh, but by 1974, all of these were gone. Uh, so there's no uh, Cold War tourism for Nike sites uh, left in Illinois. Uh, I had enlisted in 1968 in the Army's intelligence branch for... <laughs> yes, that's right, the slim, the slim Bilbo. By the way, uh, my telephone number, I'll give it to you after. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, I went through uh, counterintelligence training at Fort Halliburton in Baltimore, and the, not long ago at the members' table, I found out that uh, Bob uh, Newman here, uh, who was on our board, uh, had gone through Fort Halliburton at about the same uh, time. So thank you for your uh, service, Bob. Uh, with the Vietnam War continuing to heat up, uh, many intelligence school uh, graduates uh, went to Vietnam, including uh, Bob. Uh, this prisoner interrogation training we had reflected the reality of the of the Vietnam War going on at the time. Uh, I was older than most of my intelligence school classmates uh, and uh, had been through college and law school and even had a year of uh, practice, so uh, I think that's why I ended up uh, assigned to the counterintelligence analysis branch of the Office of the Assistant Chief of Staff for Intelligence of the Army at the Pentagon. Uh, counterintelligence has to do uh, with protecting your secrets and assets from those that uh, would do them harm. Uh, and uh, with the push on at the time to replace uh, Nike's anti-aircraft uh, capability uh, with uh, uh, an ICBM missile defense, uh, safeguard was the uh, highest priority. Uh, it was the Army's uh, ticket into the more modernized uh, future technology. Uh, and therefore, one of my first assignments was to assess the counter-espionage and counter-sabotage aspects of the program's uh, development. 
And it was impossible for me to understand those issues unless I, I hit the road. So uh, I went uh, first to the Redstone uh, Arsenal where they were designing and managing the, the development of the system uh, and then out to uh, Colorado Springs to the headquarters of NORAD. Uh, and NORAD, of course, was operating what was then the, the air defense uh, network uh, into which Safeguard would have to fit. And I got out to Kwajalein uh, Atoll uh, where they were using state-of-the-art interceptor missiles, radars, uh, optics uh, to work through the problems in this advanced systems development. And as it uh, turned out, I also made an unplanned stop at Johnston Atoll in the Pacific. Uh, as you can see, the Safeguard ABM uh, system didn't last long after I worked on it in 1969. The efforts to uh, develop a national uh, missile defense uh, afterwards never really uh, went anywhere, in part due to arms control agreements uh, and continuing technology uh, limitations. And also, as time went on, a reluctance to upset the, potentially upset the uh, nuclear stalemate uh, between the U.S. and the USSR. Uh, after uh, I left the Army in, 19, uh, in 1971, and before Safeguard was deployed, the uh, Soviets and the U.S. had already agreed to limit their ABM uh, uh, defenses to only two sites. And uh, in 76, uh, both of those, uh, the U.S. had unilaterally uh, closed. And in the 1980s, uh, Reagan's uh, strategic defense initiative called uh, Star Wars uh, produced no uh, defensive weapons, uh, although it did uh, uh, help uh, trigger the bankruptcy uh, and ultimate dissolution uh, in part uh, uh, of the Cold War. Uh, the U.S. withdrew from this uh, treaty in 2002, and that was because there was a new player on the scene, one we uh, seem to be uh, dealing with as well again today, North Korea. Uh, the only two safeguard uh, sites ever built, one was in Montana at an ICBM air base uh, and the other in North Dakota. Now, if you can believe it, this is the uh, North Dakota Mickelson Safeguard Complex in Nakoma, North Dakota, population 48. It is a Cold War tourist destination site, folks. <laughs> and today tourists uh, drop by and they take a look at the missile site radar up top and uh, below it you see the uh, uh, fields for the uh, Spartan and Sprint missiles and their silos. Uh, and uh, here's a gaggle of tourists now uh, and I'm sure you, could, you know just what they were thinking. Why spend the money to see the great pyramids in Egypt <laughs> and, and Las Vegas <laughs> when we've got a pretty good uh, pyramid here in Nakoma. Uh, so uh, in ICBM, uh, defense speed is of the essence as you would expect uh, and one way to speed things up would be uh, not to have heavy metal hatches on the silos but a styrofoam uh, hatch uh, that the missile could just blow through quite quickly, no, no waiting for it to open. Uh, and note the fence around this uh, uh, missile field. Uh, I was given pause about the styrofoam option uh, when my research turned up the fact that at an Air Force ICBM base, high schoolers had gotten over the perimeter fence. And what do you do? You paint your high school class year on a silo cover. <laughs> So after being briefed uh, on safeguard basics uh, at Redstone, uh, it was off to Cheyenne Mountain. And this slide depicts uh, the complicated current role of uh, NORAD Operations Center uh, in a battle to destroy incoming ICBMs. Uh, you access the NORAD headquarters by getting on a bus and driving uh, deep into the mountain through a tunnel. Uh, you get out of the bus, you go through uh, two blast-proof vault doors and uh, you come into this enormous cavern uh, that opens up and the granite mountain is uh, now filled in this cavern with multi-story prefabricated uh, office structures that sit on enormous I-beams and they and their utility connections are all spring-loaded so when the Soviet ICBM hits the mountain you know, they're, they're stirred and not shaken. Uh, it still is able to, to function in a, in a normal fashion. So after uh, I had this uh, education about how safeguard fit in, I, I sent uh, uh, my mother a postcard at, at home. Uh, 
And I, I joked to her that the site of my pre-battle nuclear attack briefing uh, took place uh, sensibly at the Air Force Academy's chapel. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, I then traveled to Honolulu to board a military flight to Kwajalein, uh, and uh, it stopped uh, to refuel at Johnston Atoll, one of the strangest places I have ever been to in my life. Uh, a little bit of history, the Sally discovered uh, the atoll uh, while it was transiting the Pacific and it ran aground there. Uh, and the British captain of the Cornwallis a few years later uh, modestly named the after, uh, atoll after himself. Uh, commercial development of the atoll's substantial guano deposits uh, began after Congress uh, authorized it in the mid-19th century. And the Tanager and Whipper World did scientific surveys in the early 20th century, uh, and not surprisingly, in the war in the Pacific uh, uh, during World War II, it was a, a naval and army air force refueling depot. Uh, Johnston was deactivated in 2004, and briefly and unsuccessfully put on the market by the General Services Administration of the federal government as a resort property. <laughs> Uh, the Cold War came to Johnston uh, uh, in a big way in 1958 when the first of a series of high altitude nuclear detonations uh, uh, began. Uh, as you can see uh, in this picture, Johnston is abandoned today. Uh, note the, the adjacent graphic uh, shows that the man-made uh, accretions at Johnston all occurred uh, uh, during the peak of the Cold War. Yeah. Where did they get the landfill material to build up the site? Maybe they just saved some of the guano. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Uh, can I get back to you on that? <laughs> so the Project uh, Fishbowl tests in 1962 uh, were to find out what happens when you detonate a nuclear weapon in, in space. And U.S. defense planners at the time were worried uh, that Soviet satellites uh, would be carrying a nuclear uh, bomb uh, in orbit uh, and could release it at will uh, on uh, ICBMs uh, in the U.S. or, God forbid, of course, uh, U.S. cities. Uh, these early unsuccessful tests results were nothing, uh, however, compared with the spectacular nuclear explosion uh, that was soon set off in the upper atmosphere. Uh, the first thing the blast produced was a startling artificial aurora borealis that could be seen uh, all the way from New Zealand to Hawaii, and it lasted for minutes. And no one had expected the startling effects of the electromagnetic uh, pulse. Uh, one conclusion was that some countries could have their entire electrical grid knocked out uh, with a single uh, detonation. And the radiation impact uh, on the Van Allen belt uh, and satellites was not uh, uh, foreseen at all. The next year, right after the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, the nuclear uh, uh, treaty came along. The limited test ban treaty forbid uh, atmospheric tests, uh, tests underwater, and tests in space. And six years after the limited test ban treaty was signed, uh, what I thought was this direct flight uh, from Honolulu to Kwajalein uh, stopped at uh, uh, Johnston to refuel. And uh, as we were there uh, landing, uh, on either side of the runway, I saw shelters like this, and outside of one was a Thor missile being uh, worked on. And I later uh, found out, uh, read the New York Times uh, one day, and the Thor missiles were part of a secret anti-satellite weapon system authorized by President Johnson. Uh, with the capability, indeed, to shoot down any Soviet satellites carrying nuclear bombs. In the 1990s, after the Vietnam-era uh, buildup had ended and uh, Reagan's Strategic Defense Initiative uh, uh, helped uh, finally bankrupt the USSR, uh, vast stocks of aging uh, chemical weapons were beginning to leak uh, a big problem. They were becoming unstable. Uh, where are you going to fix this? Well, what a what a great thought, uh, uh, Johnston Atoll, of course. And Johnston's new mission became uh, uh, the destruction of the most uh, deadly non-nuclear weapons in the U.S. arsenal. Uh, it took over a decade, but this was the furnace that got that job done. At its peak, over 1,200 military and military contractor personnel lived on Johnston, and 
when the toxic weaponry was gone, all of the housing and all of the other infrastructure was destroyed. Uh, Johnston wasn't just decommissioned uh, in a decade and a half ago, it was terminated with extreme prejudice. <laughs> uh, personally, I doubt that uh, Johnston will ever become the busy uh, Cold War tourist mecca that Nakoma has become. Uh, it's even more remote. Uh, it wasn't discovered until three centuries after Columbus, and then only because a ship headed elsewhere ran aground there. Uh, for most of its uh, history, it's been filled with bird crap, plutonium debris, and chemical weapons. It's been run down and left vacant for years. Uh, it has uh, virtually no significant wildlife. The largest of its big five is a coconut crab. And it's got plenty of fish, but you might die if you eat it. Uh, and let's not forget that its previous tenant failed trying to sell it. Uh, of course, uh, on the plus side, if you want to think about it that way, uh, it was once the site of the first and only artificial sunrise known to mankind. Uh, <laughs> Kwajalein Atoll, uh, here's Kwajalein Island, the largest uh, of 90 coral islets, uh, surrounds these islets to the world's largest lagoon. And uh, this is the southernmost most with a little bit over a square mile. Uh, their research and uh, weapons system functions here and on nearby Mech uh, and northern uh, uh, Roynamore Islands. Uh, these were the local uh, counter-espionage threats of the day. Uh, the problem with uh, computer emanations uh, was a security issue that was not limited to Kwajalein. It also had to be thought about uh, in the mainland. Uh, and, of course, that's pretty common taking care of that today. In 1969, a Minuteman missile, the ICBM of ours uh, at the time, was yanked with its crew at random from their uh, silos. They were trucked to Vandenberg Air Force Base north of San Francisco. The warhead was taken off. An instrument package went in. Uh, it was programmed for somewhere in the middle of the Kwajalein Lagoon. And when the reentry vehicle uh, dropped in, uh, the splash was precisely fixed by uh, radars uh, and uh, optics uh, located around the atoll. And the purpose of all of that was to see how accurate it was. And the reason they wanted to know how accurate it was was to see how uh, much of a likelihood they had of taking out uh, with a single ICBM a hardened Soviet silo. And of course, when you answer that question, uh, you also have an idea of how well they're going to do at some point in taking out your uh, hardened silos. As I came in for a landing, I could see the Kwajalein Airport terminal there in the foreground. Uh, with so little land to spare, uh, multiple radars uh, studded the truncated golf course adjacent, as you see here, to the runway. And on a later round of golf with my minder, sirens and klaxons went off. Uh, quite un unexpectedly, I was told that I needed to immediately uh, get off the course and take, and take shelter. Uh, and after briefly considering whether to soil myself before or after taking shelter, I just skedaddled. And uh, I never knew uh, exactly why, except uh, either those radars uh, on the golf course were going to fry you, uh, or uh, a missile test gone bad would have uh, debris uh, conking you uh, on the head. Uh, the terminal building was particularly busy uh, during the rush hour because the commuter planes there were taking uh, day workers up to Mech and Roynamur and bringing them back uh, in the evening. Uh, I had traveled uh, to Kwajalein with false documentation as a Department of the Army civilian, and this was to uh, prevent my low rank as an insist, uh, enlisted man from interfering with my uh, interviews and conversations with uh, higher ranking uh, military personnel, MIT scientists, software engineers, and, and other uh, experts. So for my week's stay, I got an upgrade to the bachelor officer's quarter. And uh, uh, you notice uh, that my otherwise uh, beautiful upscale uh, uh, upgraded ocean view was somewhat obstructed by aluminum foil. And I was never sure if the foil was to keep the sun out or to protect me from those radar beams that were all over the place. I'd planned to promptly conduct my uh, interviews and then head back to 
uh, Honolulu, but uh, it was not to be a congressional delegation had just arrived, uh, a staff delegation to look into a recent missile test failure and uh, judge its impact. So my minder, who happened to be the base recreation officer, took me to the uh, deserted pool and I, I spent my days uh, drinking beer there and uh, if we had them back then, uh, I would have been taking selfies instead of just talking to myself. <laughs> it was lonely indeed. Uh, and in the evenings, uh, I could go to the low life, low population, uh, uh, high alcohol uh, arena of the Yakwe Yuck Club. And that <laughs> club name uh, in Marshallese translates roughly to Aloha. Uh, during my time out period, I could see from Kwajalein's Harbor uh, the first of my destinations, the missile site uh, uh, radar on nearby Mech. Uh, then when the congressional staff left, uh, it was aloha for me too, and I was off on one of the commuter planes for my interviews. Uh, as I took off, I took uh, this picture. When this experimental radar failed to perform, as it had been uh, uh, thought it uh, would, uh, it was taken out of commission, and it was repurposed into what is undoubtedly the most expensive golf driving range anyone will ever go to. And my minder tried to get me to go inside, uh, he told me it had been, uh, it was safe, he, he said it had been unplugged and nobody was uh, allowed to flip it back on. But frankly, I was, I was having none of it. Who wants to go to an island paradise and uh, again run the risk of being fried by stray uh, radar beams? Uh, this is a picture of the uh, missile site uh, construction on MEC. The radar requires, as you might imagine, uh, massive computing capacity. Uh, all of which resides in that square structure underneath the radar itself. And as I was taken for a tour of the uh, computer area, uh, its proud uh, manager uh, told me that uh, there was more computing power in that room than existed on the planet in the mid-1950s. And for all I know, maybe he was telling the truth. <laughs> Uh, these radars on Roynimor make up what is now known as the Kiernan Reentry Measurement System. And before uh, my interviews up there, uh, I was taken to a cemetery honoring the Japanese war dead. And uh, the Marines uh, landed uh, at Roynimor in uh, January of 1944 and took the entire alto, uh, atoll two weeks uh, uh, later. And you can see the diver in the lower right there looking at one of the wrecks in the lagoon. The Target uh, Resolution and Discrimination Experiment, or TRADEX, uh, was the first of the radars built at Kwajalein. It became operational in 1962, uh, which is when the MIT scientists from the uh, Lincoln Laboratory arrived to work and uh, live on Kwajalein. Uh, upgrades uh, uh, later uh, permitted it to join the U.S. Space Surveillance Network and also to uh, track foreign missile launches and low Earth and deep space uh, satellites. I would tell you how, how this and the other radars uh, work, and it's not just because it's classified that uh, I'm not going to. It's because I never had the faintest idea how any of them work. <laughs> On the left is a photo I took of the ARPA Long Range uh, uh, Tracking and Instrumentation Radar. Uh, it was designed to show how U.S. ICBMs would appear to Soviet anti-ballistic missiles. Uh, on the right is a more recent uh, picture of the same radar upgraded uh, for the Space Surveillance Network also by MIT. The radar on the left is capable of generating high resolution images of near Earth satellites. And on the right, uh, the ARPA Lincoln C-band observables radar uh, was built with the objective of improving re-entry vehicle discrimination. Now for a, an anti-ballistic missile radar to work properly, it's gotta be able to distinguish what's the warhead coming back into the atmosphere, and what are the decoys uh, that uh, are designed to help confuse a defensive radar. Uh, so uh, that's a pretty important function. Here are some of the MIT uh, staff uh, on what's now called uh, Reagan test site at the Command and Control Center. In 1969, uh, the key rule to follow in killing a Soviet ICBM w with a ground-based missile was catch it mid-course. And that uh, rule really hasn't changed uh, uh, until uh, uh, or to this day uh, when uh, catching a North Korean uh, uh, missile in mid-course uh, still uh, is a preferred way of doing it. Uh, 
this shows the enhanced uh, role sea-based and space-based uh, detectors now play in missile defense. Uh, at some point in the future, uh, Navy ships uh, uh, near Japan may uh, get the opportunity to take out a North Korean ICBM in the boost phase. Uh, this uh, Cobra Dane uh, perimeter acquisition uh, radar has a, an azimuth of 136 degrees, which makes it well suited as well as well sighted to follow North Korean issues. Uh, following the deactivation in 76 in North Dakota, uh, an upgraded uh, perimeter acquisition radar was built uh, at Cavalier now Air Force Station. And uh, they still scan for ICBMs, but they are also are uh, uh, mapping and following all of the uh, objects in Earth uh, orbit, vast numbers uh, today, from astronaut gloves to debris and the like. Uh, this particular radar can track uh, uh, multiple objects uh, the size of a basketball at a range of 2,000 miles. Uh, the radar on the left is a perimeter acquisition radar attack characterization system in the UK. Uh, the one on the right uh, analyzes more than 20,000 tracks a day uh, from giant satellites to uh, space debris. Uh, parks are different than uh, perimeter acquisition radars uh, in that they're able to predict with extreme accuracy uh, where any particular obj object will be at any particular time. Uh, though both the US and the Soviets thought during the Cold War about uh, making the ICBMs uh, harder to hit, hit by roving them, having them rove around the country on trains, uh, only the Soviets uh, did so. And their uh, missiles on trains uh, were retired by 2005. And uh, we owe our, our director, Andrew Fox, uh, recently returned from the St. Petersburg uh, Train Museum for the picture on the lower left there. Uh, thank you for your service to the cliff dwellers. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> uh, amazingly, uh, Russian media announced three years ago uh, that the, uh, after testing, uh, the currently uh, silo and truck-based ICBM on the right there uh, will be rail-mounted and deployed later this year. Uh, well, well, we'll see. If true, uh, it strikes me as Russia answering a non-problem uh, on the cheap uh, to look like it's doing something. Uh, in a more modern twist on the retread of rail monitored ICBMs, uh, Russia said last December that its new avant-garde hypersonic ICBM was operational. Uh, and its re-entry vehicle uh, has the advantage, apparently, of being highly maneuverable as it closes in on its target. Uh, a Defense Intelligence Agency report from the fall says that the Chinese have a, have a Mach 5 uh, hypersonic missile. Uh, new threats to U.S. Uh, uh, space-based GPS communications and missile launch uh, uh, satellites uh, uh, come from uh, cyber and jamming attacks and kinetic and laser weapons. And in a modern society uh, such as ours, increasingly dependent on satellites for our normal functioning, uh, it's not surprising that uh, serious thought is being uh, given to the potential of being blinded with your satellites taken out. Uh, uh, just look at this wide array of uh, sensors and anti-missile missiles on this chart from the Missile Defense Agency of the Department of Defense. And while it reflects the command and control and battle management and communications challenges, uh, it only hints at the very complex and expensive organizational structure that underlies uh, our missile and now satellite defenses. And this is really what has led to the major restructuring that, uh, in space defenses that has uh, led to the Space Force and Space Command. Uh, a month ago, you may have seen the uh, new insignia of the Space Force, the 16,000 uh, active duty airmen and civilians uh, uh, who used to be in the former Air Force Space Command are now part of the Space Force. And uh, the Space Force and the Air Force uh, both reside within the Department of the Air Force, uh, just as the Marines and the Navy reside within the Department of the Navy. The Space Command is the warfighting command unit for the Space Theater. It's supported by two field organizations. The first has 70 Army, Navy, and Air Force uh, uh, space units, and it's uh, worried about maintaining the integrity of uh, GPS navigation and communications uh, uh, satellites uh, for not just U.S., but also allied commanders. Uh, the second uh, uh, field operation operates the classified national uh, Space Defense Center, and that's where they uh, uh, look at potential threats and draw up options uh, if uh, satellites uh, were to come under attack. Uh, 
Uh, the U.S. Space Command has now taken its place as the newest of the 11 Department of Defense uh, combatant commands. Uh, the Department of Defense's clandestine National Reconnaissance Office uh, runs the most covert uh, satellite and aerial programs. Uh, it controls uh, the satellites that uh, look at uh, and survey world trouble spots, uh, monitor the ebb and flow of nuclear arsenals, and provide uh, the information needed for verifying uh, various arms control agreements. And if war in space uh, ensues, uh, the U.S. Space Command has the ability to uh, order what are called defensive space operations. Uh, at the top of the slide, uh, you'll see the words uh, uh, SIGINT and uh, uh, IMINT and uh, MASINT. I knew the first two, image intelligence, uh, signals intelligence. I had to look up MASINT. It's the acronym for Measurement and Signature Intelligence. And <laughs> how does MASINT work, you ask? Well, I have to quote this precisely. It employs a broad group of disciplines, including nuclear, optical, radio frequency, acoustics, seismic, and material sciences. Wow. I can tell you, as an expert, that is never going to be Merriam-Webster's word of the year. <laughs> In a half century since I spent time uh, in the Army working on missile defense issues. Uh, we've grown, of course, exponentially more dependent on satellites and uh, other sensors for every aspect of our military operations. The landscape of nation states with inventories of nuclear warheads has also uh, changed substantially in recent decades. Uh, today we have nine uh, nuclear powers with uh, Iran perhaps waiting in the wings as number 10. Uh, and so far, the complexity and expense of acquiring uh, nuclear weapons has kept it a game only of nation states. And all of the nation states, of course, uh, share a strong uh, interest in keeping that uh, uh, to be the case. Uh, now, just look at the dramatic decline in stockpiles of tactical and uh, strategic uh, nuclear weapons maintained by the U.S. and Russia. Uh, we had over 30,000, Russia over 40,000. And you could look at this chart another way and say, well, this uh, perhaps is the global learning curve of learning to live with the bomb. Uh, through the movement of, uh, though the movement of uh, war planning into space it has its ominous uh, uh, overtones, it is also true that uh, in this period, the largest uh, nuclear powers have retreated uh, from the brink of war as they came to a better understanding uh, and a better appreciation of the collateral damage to their societies uh, from unrestrained competition. Well, there you have it. Uh, we're now living in an age uh, where the potential for war has uh, moved from its traditional uh, Earth surface uh, 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 to uh, Earth orbit. And uh, no doubt in another 50 years it may move along to the Moon and Mars and, and beyond. Uh, and I don't know about you, but uh, there's always been, in thinking about this, something otherworldly about it uh, for me. Uh, but think about the subject we must, even though it hasn't been much uh, uh, in the public consciousness in the last uh, several decades. Uh, it's something, of course, uh, as citizens uh, and humans, we can't uh, really get away from. Uh, shortly uh, after Hiroshima, there was a Rand uh, Corporation uh, uh, fellow uh, Bernard uh, Brody, and uh, what he did was uh, uh, write something that uh, proved to be all these 75 years later at the heart of uh, the nuclear equation of today, and it's been there all along. He said everything about the atomic bomb is overshadowed by twin facts. It exists, and its destructive power is fantastically great. And uh, because this whole realm is so complex and so dangerous uh, and so uh, expensive and intractable, uh, it looks like uh, future generations uh, such as ours are going to have to just continue uh, to keep grappling with uh, the seriousness of all of this. Uh, so um, as the last uh, charts demonstrate over this period, uh, most of the nations that could potentially have acquired uh, nuclear weapons have chosen not to. Uh, and the leading nuclear nations have actually produced the, uh, reduced the prevalence uh, and likely use of the weapons. The older nuclear powers seem to at least uh, partially digested the strange non-utility of nuclear weapons. Uh, 
Uh, and it remains an open question uh, as to whether the newer and incipient nuclear powers uh, uh, are going to uh, also assess in, in a similar way the limited value of acquiring uh, something that is so uh, constricted in its use. Uh, personally, uh, I'm optimistic that we'll avoid a catastrophe uh, in the next 25 years as we move towards the 100th anniversary of Hiroshima. Uh, my own uh, belief is that the problem will at least be less dangerous and intractable then uh, in 2045 than it is now. But then, what do I know? <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you for your uh, attention. <laughs> Bob. Is a defensive system practical when we hear that it's like shooting a bullet at a, at a bullet? Uh, I th that, that has remained the question, really, uh, from the safeguard. Uh, uh, yeah, so the question is, uh, is it really practical to have an anti-missile defense uh, if you're trying to shoot a bullet with a bullet? And uh, the answer is that it remains under investigation. I happened to be dialing this morning. Uh, you can see I was very bored. I stopped at C-SPAN. And what were they talking about? Well, our Secretary of Defense was uh, being grilled by a House uh, committee. One of the things they were talking about was exactly this, uh, that there is a, another generation of anti-missile, a missile defense, uh, which seems broader than uh, anything uh, uh, since Safeguard, uh, with not an East Coast uh, one. Uh, they're concerned, of course, seriously about Iran now. Uh, I mean, these war planners, of course, are typically thinking 10, 20, 30 years out uh, because their weapon systems have that kind of a long a long life. Look at the B-52s, they're still still around there. Uh, so uh, the answer is uh, maybe, but uh, those that have the best uh, idea about that uh, are, uh, that's all would be classified and, uh, uh, but to the, up to this point it's been too iffy. Yes, Bob. Uh, I had a, a very good friend uh, who was a relatively high level consultant to the Pentagon on the radar systems in the 1980s and 90s that were a part of the Star Wars system. In fact, he disclosed that during the 80s and the 90s, the, the radar systems, which were a key part of, as, as key a part as the missiles themselves in attempting to shoot down Russian, incoming Russian missiles, the radars were not capable but that's a different situation than most people are talking about today when you're talking about one or two missiles being fired by the North Koreans or the Iranians, uh, which is a much easier uh, task of shooting down than it was of trying to shoot down uh, these multiple warheads coming from the Russians. Yeah, absolutely. And, and one of the problems that you, you touch on there is that it was cheaper for countries to throw their money into the offense uh, than to try and build a defense. Uh, the offense uh, has uh, most of the time had an overwhelming edge. The other thing about Star Wars, uh, which was based on Edward Teller's uh, idea, he was running uh, late in his career the Livermore Laboratory uh, in the West Coast. Uh, the lasers I've been reading recently just weren't up to the task. Uh, uh, getting that uh, kind of a la laser built with the power uh, to deal with multiple incoming objects uh, over enormous distances in space, it just was uh, a, br a bridge too far. Uh, so uh, uh, technological limitations uh, uh, and also this idea that, hey, look, we've stayed away from uh, mutually assured destruction. Uh, we've stayed away from the destruction do you really want to be unbalancing what seems to have worked in an odd way uh, but with a defensive system that might make the other side uh, think that you uh, could ward off a first uh, uh, strike and uh, dump uh, your load on them anyway? The other grand problem, of course, of solving that problem of the other side taking out your uh, ICBMs, uh, there was always a solution from the beginning to that. You see them coming on the radar, uh, we've all seen the movie uh, <laughs> about that. Uh, you see them coming. Well, simple. Rather than have your ICBMs knocked out, you launch yours before they get hit. 
but no rational war planner uh, ever wanted to leave the U.S. president with that kind of a, of a 10 or 15 minute uh, uh, choice to make. Uh, so. Yes, Larry. How much does this stuff cost? Well, I think you saw the one slide, uh, which is, you know, 1970-ish dollars, uh, more or less. I think the safeguard system was about $25 billion. Uh, and that was never really deployed, you know, to test sites uh, uh, that may or may not have worked, but were click quickly found to be uh, able to be, uh, well, limited by treaty and then would have been overwhelmed anyway. You, at one point in one of your slides, you said we had 6,500 nuclear tip weapons. What would one of those cost, any guess? Uh, I, I don't. I don't. But uh, they might be... Uh, uh, they might be in storage. Uh, uh, it's, it's kind of a complicated numbers game. Uh, how many warheads are there? Well, there are those that are piled up awaiting their deactivation in accordance with the uh, arms control agreements. And then there, there are those in reserves. Uh, and then you've got those that are sitting on the end of a missile that are ready to go uh, uh, instantly. So, Well... Why don't we break up, have a drink, and talk about something more fun? <laughs> <laughs>